Last week, I preached on uh, uh, the end of chapter 4 in the book of Acts and the beginning of chapter 5. That's where we'll pick up today in Acts chapter 5. And really, the, the one takeaway from that time in God's Word that we need to remember, be reminded of, is God judges based on the intentions of our heart, the motivation of our heart. That's where God judges. That's where He looks. That's what He's looking to see. He, when He takes an x-ray and He looks at your life, what is He going to see? Do you trust Him? Do you have faith? Do you believe? Now, those are easy words. We all talk about those words. We say, yes, we believe. Yes, we trust. Yes, I have faith. But the, the, the deal is, is do we? I mean, when you're on the mountaintop and you're up there shouting hallelujah and everything is good and glorious, then it's easy to say, yes, I trust. Yes, I believe. But, but when difficulties come at that point in time, how much? How do you trust? I um, left my prop in my office. I've got a book that I absolutely love. The name of it is Love Does. Love Does. And it's written by a man by the name of Bob Goff. Uh, he's an attorney from California, and he has just had wild experiences in, our, in, in his life. And I just love the way he writes. I, he's got a warped sense of humor like I do, and, and I kind of I gel with him. And it doesn't really matter how many times I read that book I don't know how many times I've read it, but I still laugh every time. And I'm still affected. It's not a theological book. I know some people want this deep theological seminary textbook. I've had those, been there, done that, right? And, and not really looking forward to doing any more of that, right? I'm not Dr. Brian. I don't have my DD. My DD stood, stood for didn't do it, right? <laughs> I don't have a doctorate in divinity. I just, I'm just Brian, Right? I had three children in diapers, and I decided I wanted to be married rather than Dr. Stevens. So that was a good thing. But this is one of those books that when you read the chapter, this guy just says love is a verb. It is an action word. It's one of those things where we say, you tell me your love, but I'll show you my love. I, I was sharing with someone this, this past week, they're downstairs prepping, right? And, and I don't know how many we had in children's church today. I don't know how many we got downstairs. But between all of us, we probably got a pretty good crowd all over the church. But I was telling him, I said, look, we're supposed to share the gospel every day. And if we have to, we'll even use words. Amen? Love does. There should be something in our life, if you've, if you've come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've been impacted by an almighty God who has made you into a new creation, old things are passed away, all things become, and the word there is brand new. From the bottom of your feet to the top of your head and every little thing in between has been touched and, and sanctified. I'll, I'll get into those religious terms. The imputed righteousness of God has been placed upon you. When God looks at you, he doesn't see all the ugly stuff. What he sees is the, through the blood of Jesus Christ, and he sees a perfect child of God. Y'all good with that? And when you think about all that God has done for you, Shauna, Back, back here, Sandra Dorsey was back there helping out, and I thank you so much for helping out in baptismal. But she, she came out and she looked at me and she said, she told me testimony. I wanted to cry. That comes from a heart filled with love for God. And you can't turn that off. It just comes. And Shauna, what, here's the deal. Others get blessed by it. There's not too much in this world that's going to put me to tears. And, and there was a time in my life I said, Lord, would you take away the tears? They're getting in the way of my sermon. And he did, as well as the anointing and the power. And I said, Lord, if you'll ever let the tears come back, I'll never pray that stupid prayer again. And from time to time, I get in the way and I apologize for it. But sometimes your heart just overflows. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Nobody has to teach me to love my wife. 
She's down in the dungeon with the kids. <laughs> Amen. I, I, I told her, I said, I'm going to have to make an announcement that I'm not a widowed pastor. Y'all don't ever see her anymore She's because she's always in children's church. But she said, she said, Brian, I want to do this. There's a need there. She stepped up and she volunteered to do it. And I said, praise God. She loves the Lord, and that means she's going to be in children's church today. Plus, she's already heard about two billions of my sermons, so she knows them by heart. But here's the thing. Nobody teaches me to love her. My heart can't help it. And I love her more than I've ever loved her. Now, I get to, Satan can come attack me in many ways, but he's not going to attack me in my heart and my love for my wife. Well, that, that's done. That's settled. That, can I say it this way? That's solid ground. Amen. And my love for my Lord, who is my master, who is my savior, he is my God, he's the sovereign of the whole universe, but I get the privilege of bowing my knees before him. So everything that we do as a church should not come out of obligation or rules or my daddy said I'm supposed to, just your heavenly father. And just because I don't have somebody walking behind me and saying, this is how you're supposed to love your wife, I have a desire to love her with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, because it is the impulse of my life, my spirit, my soul. The same way nobody has to tell me that Christ deserves the bowed knee that we sung about. And the service. Acts chapter 5, in verse number 12. I'm going to allow you to sit while I share this morning, because we're going to finish out the whole chapter. And you might get tired and pass out if I make you stand up for the whole chapter. But y'all be standing while you're sitting. Is that fair? All right. You may be sitting on the outside, but you're standing on the inside. Look what God's Word says. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. It may have been done through their hands. In other words, God let the work of heaven be done through us but it wasn't our power that did it. What a privilege it is to be a part of the ministry of Jesus Christ. How honored we should be that God allows us to serve, not out of obligation, not out of one of those I'm supposed to, y'all look here, because we get to. We get to. And these people, of all the people in the world at that time, he was pouring himself out because he knew that they wouldn't make it about them, they would make it about Christ. So he poured his power in them, with them, and through them. It was always the hand of God, but the hand of God was on them. It says, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Are y'all getting? Are y'all starting to get a vibe here? From the beginning of Acts, when we begin it, every week we've seen, we've seen those two words, haven't we? One accord. Now, I'm not the brightest one out there. My bulb shines at about five watts sometimes. But I'm starting to get the hint that God wants us to do this together. If we can get around the throne of glory with Him, and we're looking at Him, and we're close to Him, and we're honoring Him, and we're, we're loving Him, and we're bowing before Him, and grateful. Then we look around and we say, hey, there's a whole lot of other people down this around this throne too. It's not just me, it's us. So I'm supposed to be one accord with Him, but I'm also supposed to be one accord with everybody else. And just proof text right here. If you're not, according, if you're not in one accord with somebody else, you're not in one accord with Him. You cannot be in one accord with Him, full of the Holy Spirit of God, following Him, loving Him with all your heart, if you're wrong with somebody else. It just doesn't work that way. Verse 13. I think this is a unique phrase here that they added to Scripture just so that we would know not everybody was there. They were there, the disciples. But look, it says, and it says, yet none of the rest dared join them. But the people, the ones that are looking, watching on, they esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord multitudes of both men 
and women. How many is a multitude? A bunch. <laughs> My staff member up here, bunch. I think in a Baptist church, 12 could be a multitude among some people, right? But we know that there was a multitude of people following Jesus one day, and he began to feed them, and 5,000 men as well as women and children. So I don't know what the number is. They said on that day it could have been 15, 20,000. I don't know. I don't know how many were there that day. But look what it says. When, when the Spirit of God was working upon them, believers were increasingly added to the Lord so that they brought the sick out. Now, listen good in verse 15. Remember I told you last week, be very careful about making theology out of the book of Acts because it's the acts of the apostles. It's the actions of the apostles. So when you see something happen, you see the power of God. But don't try to recreate the action except in, don't try to make it that a theology. Just let it be, become a, a, a way of seeing what they were doing and saying, amen. If there's a power of God there, let's not start, try to, to, to copy it for the sake of, sake of copying it. There's too many people that see a, a, a church that's growing and they try to copy everything that they're doing. And it may be working there, but it won't work where, where you're at, right? Too many pastors are going to conferences and thinking they've they found the secret weapon. The secret weapon is Jesus Christ, right? Follow the Holy Spirit of Him. All that other stuff is just stuff. But it says here, uh, they brought the sick out into the street and they laid them on beds and couches uh, that at least the shadow of Peter passed by might fall on some of them. Now, if some of y'all try to follow me around, some, my shadow will hit you. Bless you. You're going to have to be laying down somewhere. I don't know. Well, it says here that that um, they laid them on the beds and couches and at least the shadow of peace or past Peter passed by might fall on some of them. But a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities. Everybody's getting involved in this. They came to Jerusalem. They're bringing the sick people who were tormented by unclean spirits and they, they were all healed. Hold on. I said that quick. All healed. I may need to slow this down. They were... So is there one thing that when Jesus finds it, he says, I don't know if I can deal with that or not. Is there anything that Jesus finds that he said, I don't know that I'm willing to do that or not. What you see is people coming and no one was turned away. God loves to bless more than we love to receive. So, verse 17, let's get to the meat of the matter here. Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. Oh, that's not good. What is this phrase that we've been seeing every week among the believers of Jesus Christ? They are filled with, they're in one accord, but they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Anybody want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Amen. As He leads, He loves, and He guides, right? But these are the religious people here. This is the church folk. They should have known. Hold on. But instead of having love ooze from their life, actions of love, it said that they were filled with indignation. Who's leading them? Yes, the spirit of Satan, the pride of self, those who want their way and they don't care, those who don't listen. The, the only thing that they care about is that they're in charge and they get their way. And, and Jesus wasn't playing that game. So they're filled with, listen, they want their way, and if they don't get their way, they'll be angry. And Jesus wasn't doing things the way they thought they should be done. These followers now were doing things that they didn't think that they were be done, should be done. And out of anger and hatred of heart, this is what's happening. Verse 18, they laid their hands on the apostles and they put them in the common prison. Kind of like a jail. Outer wall, you go in. Inner building, Closed in, taken to a holding cell, 
locked in the holding cell, guards put inside, guards put, well, if you were mean enough, they put them on the inside, but they definitely would put guards on the outside of the door, on the outside of the building, and at the gate. That's just the way they did things. The way that we do things today. Verse 19. Keep up with me now. But at night, an angel of the Lord, and he's got angels. Let me, let me just remind you that if the God in heaven looks at one of those angels and says, I got a job for you to do, go and do this. They don't back talk. Out of honor and awe and respect of the sovereignty, of their appreciation, of their love for him, they would do anything that he asked them to do. Shouldn't we be the same way? Oh, it's quiet in here today. An angel came and opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go. Uh, is that an action word? All right, y'all look up here. Oh. Some people believe sitting is an action word. You know what that is? Sitting. And you may be going in your head, but you're not going with your feet. But if you're going to go, you got to get up and go. So he says, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Why is that important? They just got thrown in jail for this. That's like going out and going down the road and get caught speeding. And you get the ticket. And you peel out. <laughs> Throw rocks at that police officer. Wave bye to him. Catch me if you can. And the lights come on. You're an idiot. Well, I shouldn't have said that. But you are. But the Lord says, go. I don't care what you just did. I know what they told you. I know that you just came from prison. But hear this. I just got you out of prison. I got this. You can trust me. Well, verse 21, when they had heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. They're not worried about consequences. I'm going to do what God asked me to do because I love him. It's the motivation of my life. They entered the temple, but the high priest and those who came with him came and called the council together. And with all the elders and the children of Israel, they sent to the prison to have them brought. Hey, we, we got them. Let's go. We're going to have a trial. He's got, he's got his kangaroo court put together, and this is going to be short, sweet, and to the point. Verse 22, when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely. Securely. It was shut securely, and the guards standing outside before the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. I don't know what happened. They vanished. They're gone. They were transported. I don't know what happened. Well, the Bible says that they walked out, but they're not there. Verse 24, when the high priest, the captains of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, here's the phrase in verse 24, they wondered what the outcome would be. Now they're thinking, before, they were just reacting. But now they're saying, how could this be? Well, so verse 25, one came and told them, saying, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple, and they're teaching the people. Now they're just mad. They're like, I told them not to do that. We, I don't understand this, but we're going to get them this time. So in verse 26, it says, the captain went with the officers. He's going to take charge of this. Y'all know those personalities? I'll make sure we get this right. And he gets up there and he says, come on, we're going to go get them. And he brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked, saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? I thought we told you not to do this. We, we told you, we commanded you with all the authority we have. We said you 
cannot preach in His name. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. I think this is hilarious. You're, you're filling Jerusalem with this doctrine. Everybody's hearing about it. And you're trying to say it's our fault. You're trying to bring this man's blood on us. Let me just back you up to Matthew chapter 27. You don't have to turn there. Just listen. In Matthew 27, they were before Pilate. And Pilate is saying, I find no fault in this man. Right? Pilate had been scolded. You need to quit crucifying people. You're crucifying people all the time. But I want you to hear what these leaders, these same leaders said. Matthew 27, verse 25. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. That's pretty plain, isn't it? We'll take it. That'll be, that'll be our responsibility. You don't worry about that. His blood's on us. It'll be on the next generation and the next generation. But what are they saying now? He said, look, you're trying to put this man's blood on us. You're trying to blame us for this. Acts 5, 29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Hold on. In Acts chapter 4, when they were brought before this same group of people, they made this statement. When they were told, so they called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John answered and said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. But this time, they're a little bit more blood. They're a little bit more bold. This time in verse 29, it says, we ought to obey God rather than man. Before they were just saying, I don't know, but we've got to do. We, we, we have a bad case that can't help us. We can't help but speak. But now they're just saying, no, this is the right thing. I know it's right. And because I love, I'm going to do it. You can do all the other things of deciding among yourselves. But I, one thing we know, we've got to do it. This is the reason why, verse 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered, by hanging on a tree. But him, God has exalted to his right hand to be the prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. By the way, I could never preach that short of a sermon, but it sure was a good one. You know what he's saying? He is Lord, he is Savior, he is God, and we serve him. We're going to follow him. We love him, and because we love him, we're going to obey him. So what did these religious people do? Verse 33. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. By the way, they would plot to kill them in the name of God. Now, in verse 34, coming down, there's a man by the name of Gamaliel. We'll talk about him later. Let me just tell you that Gamaliel was a leader of this group of people. He was actually the teacher of, and the mentor of Saul, who became the Apostle Paul. A man who never did anything to Jesus, but persecuted those that followed Jesus. And basically, Gamaliel just says, hey, y'all need to leave these guys alone. If this is of God, and you're fighting them, you're fighting against God. If this is not of God, it'll go away. Don't worry about it. It'll go away. He said in verse 39, but if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it lest you even be found to fight against God. So they agree with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, well, we won't kill them. We're just going to beat them. We'll bless their heart. When they, after they had beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. 
Now, I'm not spending much time on this, but let's not underestimate the pain of the beating. Let's not underestimate being hated by those that are in charge. I don't know who they are, but there's a lot of people that are people pleasers. They want everybody to like them. They're afraid of letting anyone down. Things can be difficult for these people. The Bible says it is impossible that offenses don't come, but yet we don't like to be on the outside. But the question is really, would you rather obey them or be on the outside of Christ? Would you rather be obedient to Christ or obedient to the, the ways of this world? Now, I just want you to allow the Holy Spirit to remind you. Because in the day in which we live, it's going to get worse. We're going through Daniel on Wednesday nights and people want to ask me all the time. They say, is this the last days? Sure does look like it. But if it's not the last days for the world, it's definitely the last days for the United States. We are turned in the wrong direction. And there may have been times in our past where thousands and thousands of Christians could get together and the world said it was a good thing. We are hated. And those things are not happening because Christians feel uneasy today about publicly living their love. I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet. I'm just here to tell you that the signs of the times are there. You can look at the tree like Jesus said and you can see the condition of the tree and know what the season is. And when you look at America and you see the anti-Christian, we are now a post-Christian society. You may be looking back to the 50s and 60s and 70s and saying, I remember when. That's not today. And today is the day that the Lord has made. And God wants us to serve Him with gladness today. We can't just continue to holler about the evils of society. What we're to be is to be light of Christ in this society. We are the salt that preserves the goodness of God in this society. These guys... Though they were beaten, come on now, they were not discouraged. What was meant to stop them fired them up and got them going even more. What Satan brings against us to hurt us, we understand that God has allowed it and all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. So God's going to turn that evil and make good out of it. In your day, in your situation, in your circumstance, we're going to stand, we're going to love loud. We're going to love with all of our heart because that's what he's done for us. We're going to give him our best because that's what he did for us. He gave us his best. And there's not a thing that can separate me from the love of God. Except a poor, cold heart that only wants to be blessed, but never wants to serve and love. He just basically says, after they had beat them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus. And they let them go, so they departed from the presence of the council. Verse 41. They, they departed rejoicing. <laughs> Mark, let's go get the whips. We're going to whip everybody in here and send them out the door. I'll be on the unemployment line faster than you can say lickety split. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame. Suffer shame, the ridicule of others for the name of Christ. So they took that love, they took that rejoicing, they got a good night's sleep. And verse 42 says, And daily in the temple, where all those Sadducees were walking around, 
And in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So many are filled with fear that they never find the power of faith. So many are people are holding on to their own life, their own opinions that they never learn to live. So many only care about their time and what they're doing with their time that they never understand the importance of eternity. I want you to please hear these words of Christ. Jesus' words in Luke 9, 24. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. If we're so concerned with us, if we're so ashamed to stand up publicly, if we're so ashamed to be counted with Christ, Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. Can we just talk for a second? We love the Lord, don't we? Amen. He is the apple of our eye. I love Him more than gold and silver. Only you can satisfy. Amen. Those are good words. We love the Lord. I wonder when we leave church today, are we going to be open to love out loud? Are we going to look at people and see things and just have to love? Um, I, I have to repent a lot up here, so let me, can I repent one more time? I went by and got the chicken and the ham church this morning. And uh, I was bringing it to church. And um, on my way to church, about two blocks from here, there was a girl that looked like she was about, I don't know. I mean, everybody looks, the older you get, the younger they look. I'd say young 20s, if I were, was guessing. She had two little boxes of clothes beside her in the misting rain, on the phone. I didn't have a place to pull over. And I had hot chicken in the back, and I had to get to church, and I, I had Sunday school that I had to get ready for. And Shauna, I'm sorry, I didn't get to talk to you about baptism at that time. And I, was, I had 10 things to do. I hadn't brushed my teeth. Really important stuff. And I thought, you know, I think Jesus would have said, forget the chicken and the ham in the back seat. And he probably would have went to that little girl and said, can I help? But you know what I did? I brought the chicken in here and Daryl helped me get it out and got it downstairs and answered questions and talked to people and was late to Sunday school. But I'm standing up here to tell you Really, I was loving my responsibilities of church more than I was loving Jesus. And that's wrong. Why didn't I just stop? In the misting rain, there's a little girl out there. I don't know if she got put out. I don't know. Anybody else see her? Margaret saw her. <laughs> Let the church be the church. Let the people rejoice, for we've settled the question and we've made our choice. Let the anthems ring out, songs of victory swell, for the church triumphant is alive and well. But not if we don't love and not if we don't love loud. We were not 
called to be silent Christians. I repent. And I pray I'll do better.